Yeah. 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 Yeah.
all the speakers and when we go back home our experience is more enriched we won't go back with the same uh probably in the past we believed that the world was flat but when you go back home it's not the same anymore <laughs> so anyway just uh to give a little introduction my name is nelson oleria um the co-founder of uh, national life masai consultancy uh this is my lovely wife for the last uh 18 years uh maggie Oleri. Oh, and this is my really oh, yeah. oh and <laughs> <laughs> sorry and my brother rick Olomunyak. so um so before we go into the nitty-gritty of our talk uh, based on our conservation model in Masai Mara. I'd just like to give you an overview about Maasai culture and their way of life because sure many of you are like wondering who are these people dressed in red and uh, do they wear like this every day and yes we do and um, they are wearing are they uh, you know um, clothing that our people wear on a daily basis but when you have more beads and it means you have a position of leadership in the community so um and whenever you're going to meetings you'll not just walk into a meeting without the proper dressing for such an occasion so anyway the maasai people um are a nomadic group of people uh, who lives in the rift valley uh in kenya and tanzania actually in the past they were believed to have originated in the lower Mesopotamia uh, between the two rivers. And uh, the writer Herodotus used to write about people who fought with long spears and covered themselves with large shields, and they were called the Maasai. So the Maasai walked through that valley into Egypt and there was some belief that at one time they were also pharaohs and uh, they walked down the valley through Sudan and Ethiopia into their present area of abode in Kenya and Tanzania. The Maasai number about 1.5 million uh, people. And there are more of them in Tanzania than Kenya. Uh, the Maasai are called Maasai because they speak a language called Ma. So Maasai, you know, is derived from the language that we speak. So they are nomadic uh, pastoralist group. They used to be, you know, to move from one area to another. But unfortunately, in the last uh, 100 years, they lost most of their land. Actually, um, when the British uh, arrived into Kenya and Africa to colonize, the Maasai occupied most of the Rift Valley. But uh, when we had the settlers coming in, they discovered all these empty savannah, and they thought the owners were not there. But you know, they move uh, following the rain patterns and leaving some certain areas to regenerate and coming back later. Uh, however, um, most of their land was taken away. Actually, uh, Maasai land used to be 30,000 square kilometers, and they lost 65% of that land. And they were pushed into two territories called the Maasai districts. And um, when they were pushed into those territories, there was an agreement which was signed, thumbprinted thumb between their spiritual leaders and um, the British government. And uh, they were told if they could stay in their two districts, um, they, will not, they will be allowed to practice their culture as long as they remain within the district, they will not be forced into labor like other tribes. So they chose that kind of dignity, like to lose uh, all their land and to remain in two reservations, as long as they were allowed to continue 
practicing their culture. Um, uh, so um, the Maasai um, are governed by a traditional system of laws, you know, uh, where we have a council of elders um, who are supposed to govern uh, what takes place in the activities of the community. Um, they live in traditional communities called uh, bomas. So a boma is usually an enclosure containing about 30 houses, depending on the size of the family. And the enclosure is fenced to keep away uh, marauding animals because we have a lot of animals uh, uh, in that area. And uh, the houses are small uh, and they are built by women. Usually the weaving sticks together, grass, and then it's covered with fresh dung. And it doesn't have a lot of, uh, it's, so it's not, a, it's not exactly a castle like this one. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's a very small round house with barely any windows. It's only a small hall called a Lucy to allow uh, light to come into the house. And the house traditionally has about three beds, you know, uh, one for the mother, the other for visitors, and one other for children. And there was also space uh, for young calves and lambs. And for the husband, they would usually have a small house of their own outside because of uh, respect and uh, uh, privacy issues. So um, yeah, and everybody has a role to play. The role of boys uh, is actually to learn how to take care of livestock, so their fathers would mentor the young ones and the mothers will also teach the young girls and they are usually rites of passage for example from the age of 13 between the age of 13 and 17 uh, both boys and girls are required to go through uh, circumcision uh, which is a big problem especially for girls which maggie will be talking about uh, but usually after circumcision which is a rite of passage the boys would go into warriorhood and they become warriors to create a new generation for 10 years. Uh, when they are warriors, they have their own um, special village where they are mentored by the elders and they learn to become strong uh, to defend the community. The warriors are the, like the defenders of the community. And after 10 years of creating that generation, they would graduate into uh, junior elders. And actually, um, when I became a junior elder myself, which I'll talk about that, because that is actually when we were able to create National Icon Conservancy, uh, Rick Young was already adopted into our community as a respected uh, elder, but I'll talk about that later. But in the meantime, I would just also like to you know, give Maggie a chance to talk about Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm going to, because just in the order of the slides, I'll just show how strangely how we are connected. Um, because this this picture here is uh, part of Nashalai Conservancy in the Maasai Mara, but the story that brought Nelson and Maggie and me together, uh, for me, started very far away on the other side of the world, up on the Pacific coast of Canada. And for those of you who were here yesterday at the presentation about Salmon Nation, um, that is up there. So this is the Kitlope River. Um, it couldn't be uh, farther uh, geographically or more different um, uh, in terms of habitat than uh, the savanna of the Masai Mara. And yet, oddly, there's a very similar connecting story, and I think that it's aligned to the chart, um, and all of us who are here are trying to do, which is to find ways to connect some dots. So uh, this is absolutely majestic uh, land, glacial waters, uh, um, on the um, about uh, midway up the um, Pacific coast of British Columbia. 
and it was the ancestral and spiritual home of the Heisla First Nation, so we call uh, indigenous uh, First Nations people in Canada. Um, and um, it was uh, inhabited after um, European uh, Europeans came. I mean, there had been a very robust community living on that river. Uh, after Europeans came, uh, and by the um, sort of middle of the 20th century, there were maybe somewhere eight to 12 families, very dispersed. It's very, very remote. One of those men, and one of the people who was there, is a man named Cecil Paul, a man uh, I am really honored to say has become a great friend of mine, um, who's given me permission to tell his story, because stories are a form of property for many indigenous people. Uh, when he was a very young boy, um, he was and lived on that river, was taken from that river, the only place that he knew, the only culture that he knew, uh, the only world that he knew, uh, in, through a policy of the Canadian government to what we called residential schools, but it was essentially to Canadianize, quotation marks, Canadianize the savage. Um, I won't go into detail about it, but I promise you it's one of the greatest stories you've ever heard. Um, we'll hear one day. But Cecil uh, became, um, Cecil was taken away. He became, uh, after, uh, after that residential school, which broke so many people, it broke him, and lived for many years uh, a, a kind of derelict and drunken life on the streets of Vancouver and so on, and then somehow felt a calling to go back to his land of his origin, which was hard to get to and um, sat alone on the banks of the river for many days until he felt the spirit of his people speaking to us and his grandmother and uh, decided to re rejoin his community and after an extraordinary set of events actually ended up being the catalyst for saving this land um, which is the uh, turns out to be the largest intact coastal temperate rainforest in the world fighting enormous forces, both government and corporate. Uh, and he gave me the permission to tell his story, which I did, and it's the story of the magic canoe, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but I was invited to give that talk uh, at a, uh, oh, well, this was the 10th anniversary celebration. I think you would have seen this photograph in Ian's presentation yesterday of the victory of saving the Kitlope. And I was lucky enough to have been there. And then I was invited to give a talk at the world's first uh, indigenous network conference in Darwin, Australia, where I spoke. Um, and there's a picture of Cecil, and that's me. And there's a young woman uh, holding a paddle, an indigenous woman who came with me. Uh, and I also brought a message just to show how the dots really do connect in this world. So a middle-aged middle-class Jewish guy from very urban guy from Toronto uh, who somehow made a friend on the west coast of Canada invited to speak in Darwin Australia where I met a Maasai man but was also carrying a message from this guy who happened to be traveling in the International Space Station leading um, <laughs> leading that leading that mission and i had access to him and i told i told him that i was going to australia to talk about the magic canoe and gave him a sort of a briefly the story of the magic canoe so i think in a world of many many billions of selfies this may be the very best one because that's not photoshopped he made that sign <laughs> and that is our earth behind him out the window uh and i got to tell that story and nelson liked it and uh <laughs> And we, we met and uh, became friends. Uh, and that's how I got to the Maasai Mara. But now let me, and Maggie, I can just, you can just talk about the people and the place. I've got some pictures that you know of you and some oh, of the people. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, good afternoon again. My name is Maggie Reya uh, from Kenya, and I am Maasai. And uh, yeah, just to brief you about where we come from. Oh, that's me. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you the story of the people. The Maasai, as Nelson said, are a pastoralist community. And uh, they live in um, bombers, as he said. And boys will go herd cattle, 
And young girls will then be taught how to be uh, good mothers in future. They will go collect firewood. They will go collect water. I mean, and they just get groomed so that they can become uh, wives. And um, that uh, being the case, um, Yeah, that being the case, that this tells you that Maasai women then didn't have an education. They will look after um, their children, their husbands, and that is exactly what it was for them. But now this brings us to my story. Why am I here? How did I get an education? Uh, so I happened to have a father who was a chief. Uh, being a chief is... Um, being a respected person in the community, people will listen to you, you will give direction. Uh, and the Maasai have their traditions, a tradition that they follow. And my father being a leader, should have been an example to follow these traditions. Well, he knew that the Maasai traditions were good, but we had a negative aspect of our traditions. And this came up about when I was 12 years of age. Because when a girl is 12 years old, she is prepared for adulthood. She's mutilated. There's something called female genital mutilation. So a girl will be mutilated, and then her husband will be spotted because soon she's going to be given away. Um, but then um, my father was different. He said, you know what? I want you girls to have your education. I want you to live to your dreams. I don't want you to be married. I don't want you to be mutilated. And the community did not like this. They thought, what the hell is happening with this man? Why do you want to drop our traditions? But my father didn't have an education himself, but I don't know how, but he just happened to have chosen the right path for us. I have a sister, the rest are boys, and he gave us an education uh, in state. And today I advocate for girls' rights, providing education opportunities for them. Um, I work with women of the community, those that didn't have an education. Well, I believe it's not over. What is it that we can do to help these women? What is it that we can do to help them help their daughters and their sons? So um, that is what I do. I advocate for women's rights. And then I'll, I hope we'll talk more. So, right. Nelson. Nelson, yeah, just to say that it's actually an extraordinary time, I think, mm. Maasai time, a time of trying to hold on to deep culture, uh, deep traditions, deep knowledge, and also be in the modern community. Yeah. You know, we don't have warriors anymore. Um, and the yeah. uh, and youth development, cross gender is very, very important. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so like I said before, uh, our community uh, practice practices nomadic pastoralism. Uh, so, they are people of the land. Land is very important to the Maasai community, and cattle are also very important. It is actually their currency, probably to an Italian or an American. Um, money in a bank account is something very important. Uh, so equally to the Maasai, cattle are a kind of currency. They give you self-esteem. They give you respect. And, uh, you know, if you are going to marry someone's daughter, you must be wealthy. And that means wealth is measured in the number of cattle that you have. And uh, besides that, uh, cattle providers 
with the nourishment that we need. You know, Maasai uh, depend on their cattle for food. So primarily the food of the Maasai is meat, milk, and blood. So sometimes we mix blood with the milk to get the nutrients and iron that uh, can be given for example, when a woman gives birth or when a boy is circumcised. So cattle um, are everything to the Maasai. And just shortly about food, because uh, this being a food symposium, food is something very important also to the Maasai. Um, and it is something, you know, the Maasai have a saying that uh, you cannot go to war on an empty stomach. So food is everything uh, to them. And even though you may think uh, that it's quite a scarce diet compared to what all the gourmet meals we've been having here. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we cherish the spirit of sharing. And uh, it's very rare for a Maasai man or woman to eat their food alone. So there is that spirit of sharedness. They share the little that they have. And besides, I, that's what I, I was going to go there. <laughs> so besides sharing the food with one another, actually they also share it in ceremony with God. Like when a woman is milking the cattle, before she feeds the milk to her children or to any other person, she will throw a bit of it into the heavens to Enkai, who is our God, you know. Um, so coincidentally, like everyone knows, the Maasai believe that God lives in, um, in, 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 in heaven. So, um, so talking about that, um, I happen to be quite lucky uh, uh, myself to have had a chance to go to school. And when I was growing up, um, it, there was this pressure by the government to force, you know, Maasai families to at least send one of their children to go to school. And usually the one who will be picked up to go to school would be the, from the wife that the husband did not like. It was a form <laughs> of punishment. And for me, it was both because my mother was strong-willed and was not, they were not, always in good terms with my father. And I was not a good herder, so I lost a goat. Uh, one day when I was looking after sheep and goats uh, in the bushes, and in the evening when we came back with the, the other hundreds of sheep and goats who didn't get lost, uh, my father, I don't know, you know, he just have, he just have his power to observe the flock and would immediately know without even counting that one was missing as if it was photographed into his memory so he immediately knew that one goat was missing i think it was eaten up by a hyena or something in the in the plains and for that reason i had to be punished in the worst way possible and that was by sending me to go to school <laughs> and for my mother it was also an opportunity for my father to get rid of her you know, <laughs> because uh, when you had to go to school, it meant moving out of the home, moving out of the traditional way of life to join this mysterious new way fronted by Christian missionaries. Most of the schools were run by missionaries because the government, as I told you earlier, had put them aside in a reservation and closed the district completely. So there was the deal was the Maasai would not be forced into labor like the other tribes, but they wouldn't get out of their district. They stay in their county, in their, well, their whole districts. They stay in their district. So no one was allowed to get into the closed Maasai district except uh, Christian missionaries who build schools. So that, that is the kind of school I attended. And um, so we moved out into this village. Uh, it was like... Uh, a boarding center, except that it was not a school. It was a village just to get near to the school. It was still about two kilometers away from the school. Uh, how far, was, how far did you have to walk? Yeah, I was coming into that. Um, um, so, <laughs> I mean, not 
photograph. Uh, well, <laughs> that that time it was still very close by, but unfortunately our resources ran out. My mother did not have any means of supporting me anymore, so she went to back to her own parents, who lived in an area close to the Masai Mara National Reserve. And uh, I was stranded, and I had to go back to my father's village. And already I've been inspired. My heart has been opened up into education and learning. Uh, but now I had to go back home to my father. And he lived in a village which was 40 kilometers away from school. So it was a question of either dropping out of school or continuing to walk into school every day from that village 40 kilometers away. And I opted uh, to walk into school. So that was my earlier upbringing, walking into school every day, 20 kilometers one way and 20 kilometers back. Um, but I never gave up and um, I continued into a boarding high school that meant for the first time I could have shoes in my life. And there was like, uh, when I got the admission letter that you had to buy shoes, you had to have uniforms, you must come carrying a pair of shoes. And I literally walked into school carrying, holding my pair of shoes in my own hands because I, I didn't know that you could actually, I never wore shoes before. And the letter was saying, you must come carrying a pair of shoes. I just went carrying my own pair of shoes and the headmaster was like, where is this one from? Huh? <laughs> And, um, but luckily, you know, I continued into my education, going into Nairobi and becoming a, getting college education and going into university and becoming a college professor in Nairobi. But my desire was always to go back home because I knew that um, as we are Maasai people, we, you know, we have our, we have our feet on both sides of the river. We want to keep our old traditions, yet the new reality demands that we must be able to communicate with a changing world. And education opens up possibilities for that kind of communication. And so, um, yeah. Um, did we, did we, did we quite again? Should we just show them a little yeah. bit? Of, yeah. uh, just what it looks like. So just to because you get a sense can of explain that. how it looks like all the fields. That's Masai. Yeah, so this is a beautiful Masai Mara. It's more of a savanna grassland area, so you see. And like Tuscany, where you have a lot of hills, it's very plain and you know, those are the beautiful animals, those are zebras, and um yeah, those are the prints of the Mara. You can see some lines. Rhino over there. Yeah. Where's a rhino? See a rhino. Yeah, oh, lions. It's, a, lions. it's a lion, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, lion. So that is what it looks like. You know, we have elephants roaming, and sometimes they will roam into Maasai bombers, like because there is no fence. They just roam around inside and, and outside. And we were talking about this uh, last night. I think it was when you come in. At the, you know, this is also the place where humankind comes from. So there is something of this place that has a really deep psychic hold on our attention and our sensibility. It's something that happens when we come there uh, as you feel oddly uh, at home. And of course, it's a huge torch there. And a um, you know, it was uh, colonized uh, and then commercialized through tourism. Though it was Maasai land, the Maasai were not the uh, controllers, owners, or really the beneficiaries of the commercialization. And, but this is what people have come to see uh, when they come in uh, the hundreds of thousands every year. It's, you know, the bucket list opportunity and desire for so many people. That's what they come to see. What they don't come to see is this. And maybe you could just explain yeah. why. Um, so the Mara Serengeti ecosystem 
um, is the largest conservation area probably in the entire continent of Africa. It still has the largest amount of free ranging wildlife that you could possibly imagine in the world. Yet there was a big threat because of the change in land use policy around the Masai Mara and Serengeti. Actually, I was reading an article uh, two days ago that this ecosystem, the largest remaining wild uh, wildlife ecosystem in the entire continent of Africa, and probably one of the also biggest in the world, is under severe threat. But it didn't take that article to remind us, we always knew, because we have seen the kind of changes that are taking place there. We have seen that instead of having the free-ranging wildlife that you saw earlier forming a line, that's actually called the Great Migration, which is a phenomenon taking place every year between July and October, and it involves 1.5 million wildebeest, zebras, topis, crossing over from Serengeti into the Mara. But even, even still, the Mara is not adequate to contain all those animals, which have learned over the years to uh, foster their own survival by making use of the larger ecosystem. So they still need to fan out beyond the Mara into the community lands and you know further north uh, forming great migrations and staying in the that ecosystem for three months between july and october before ultimately going back into serengeti and into ngorongoro where they will give birth in a place called the Dutu plains and begin the migration again with their young one to show the way and just repeating the cycle of life uh but and it's been there for millions of years. But now, when they come to the Mara, uh, and they have crossed over into the community land, they come across the fences. And it's just been a tragedy because many are killed, as you can see, um, you know, when they're trying to jump over, because they have photographic knowledge of place. When they come, when elephants migrate, well, the bees migrate, they always follow the footsteps of their ancestors. And they, when they come back and they find the fences, they just go through them and get killed in their thousands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I think um, that um, this is the kind of problem uh, that you were describing. Hello. Hi. I'll come up. Um, this is the kind of problem that you were describing, that Mikhaili was describing uh, yesterday. It's actually a complexity challenge. Uh, nobody put up that fence to say, let's kill a wildebeest, because we'd love to see a slaughtered, decaying wildebeest in our territory. But you've got climate change, you've got poverty, you've got land commodification, so that you have people then parceling off their land, and that, and that the, and then the, the, those age-old patterns that uh, Nelson was just describing get disrupted. This is an unintended consequence of a complex system, but it is a absolute tragedy. This is the tragedy of the commons, which I think is a, is the challenge that we're all facing, and. We hear a lot about poaching, which is a real problem, but if we really want to understand the problems of this part of the world, we have to understand habitat degeneration, um, which is not only the productive capacity of the land, but also the commodification of it, which results in the parceling of it. So it, this degradation has profound consequences um, for all of us. And um, so, if I just could just say this, uh, when Nelson invited, you know, I got inducted as an elder, and then I was a more senior elder to Nelson, and then he needed four elders to attend him during his induction, and uh, I, I, because he's a very wonderful and loving brother, 
with extraordinary sense of humor, he uh, invited me to be one of the four elders that attended him during. <laughs> Uh, and the day before his big, big ceremony, which uh, intended as a very deep traditional ceremony, we were in the local town of Narok buying supplies, but talking nonstop about the problem that was happening right on the land where Nelson was from, this parcel of land where that picture I just show, showed you happened. We're talking about what to do and what to do, and then as we were loading the car with the supplies of the party, we saw this van, a Matatu, with that sign. So I took that picture because it seems to me that that is the kind of uh, strategy that we could think uh, maybe work, but um, <laughs> Nelson and I thought maybe something a little bit more intentional. Um, but I also use this picture a lot with many of the uh, groups that I work with because it seems to me uh, that so much of our efforts at so-called social change are really forms of this. As though there is power elsewhere, and all we need to do is be supplicants of that power or stamp our feet and demand that that power do something as though power is outside of us rather than inside of us. And then what it takes to bring about change is the kind of courage and humility that you're talking about. But forms of agency where people in place say it is ours to do. So uh, it's a kind of a joke, that picture, but it's actually very central to what is my ongoing frustration with most attempts at social change. Because um, it has a lot to do with where we think power really lies. Yeah. Um, so I'll just quickly run, run you through on how we started our conservancy. Uh, Nelson and I at the ceremony, we had a whole day and we were talking and talking to the elders and Nelson was putting forward this idea that had been percolating for so many years, but that man on the far right, uh, who had actually known Richard Branson, who'd set up a conservancy not far from um, this one, said to Nelson and to all of us as we were talking about it, he said, it's a good idea, a community conservancy, but not, absolutely not, without the trust of the community. Um, so in the meantime, we have always appreciated the fact that uh, uh, solutions to problems afflicting communities ultimately come from within. So at least that is my personal belief in life, and I, I share this with Maggie, uh, because we you know when um, after finishing high school, I couldn't get a job in the Mara, because yeah, I wanted to work in the Mara as a waiter or anything, uh, you know, um, but I couldn't get a job in the Mara. The whole tourism industry, a multi-billion dollar industry uh, that works on Mars Island, uh, seemed to have an intention of depriving uh, that particular community. With all the billions coming in from tourism, going into lining our pockets of either foreign investors or corrupt officials uh, walking away from the land. And poverty continues to arise just a few meters uh, outside of the Masai Mara National Reserve. And, you know, Maggie and I wanted to look into this challenge and see what we can do. So uh, we started the first safari camp in that area, Walder Poimara Camp. Uh, to provide solutions and employed members of the local community, give them dignity, and actually also opened up a training center where the local youth can come and get skills, you know, to learn, you know, the skills that they could do to improve their lives. Uh, but building up on that success, uh, starting up the first uh, safari lodge owned by the local people, we wanted to also create a conservancy. Uh, in Kenya, um, a conservancy is 
land set aside for wildlife conservation. It could be by anybody who owns land. It could be a private land owner. It could be a community that owns land. It could be a company. So it's a form of land use, which is actually recognized by our legal system presently. So that is a bonus because in the past, uh, conservancies outside of the national parks or game reserves were not considered to be a form of land use. But the government also has lately come to realize that um, the future of wildlife survival in Kenya lies actually with communities, giving them or uh, anyone with land. Because the problem currently in wildlife is not even poaching. Poaching is a big problem anywhere in Africa. But the real problem is the lack of space. As you can see, the, the fences blocking the migration of wildlife. That is where the real challenge is. And uh, for us as a community, we've been losing land. And we continue to lose land almost on a daily basis. There are buyers coming in, speculators, corrupt uh, people coming to launder money by buying land. It, uh, these are actually for the government to demonetize money because people are not keeping money in, in bank accounts, actually keeping it... Uh, in underground falls and buying land in pastoral areas as a way of cleaning up that money. So we saw this reality and we decided that we have to do something. And that is how we started the idea of creating a conservancy. And our conservancy started by talking to the uh, gentleman who is my neighbor in the village. We call him, or uh, Rick like to call him Mr. Two. Um, starting a <laughs> yeah. So I mean, starting a conservancy is not an easy thing because it means you are, you have to ask people not to continue using land uh, for farming or even to continue selling it or to fence it or to use it for their pastoralist activities. So how do you come to my house and say, "Don't use that farm because I want wildlife to go through it or I want it for to remain." We want to rewild it and, you know, so you have to compensate people. You have to compensate uh, uh, those communities that you are telling not to continue using the land in the way that they would have preferred to use it. Because remember, land is privately or now. It's no longer community land as in the past. It has been, uh, there has been a change in land on ownership policy from community on to individual owned and parceling of the land and fragmentation. So what we did is actually to consolidate the land back. And we had a single message that it is possible to create a conservancy where people, wildlife, livestock can all coexist together. I think growing up, Maggie, um, this is a kind of um, um, life we are used to. We have always seen elephants walking majestically past our villages. Uh, growing up in Savannah, going herding cattle, sheep and goats, we could see animals, we could interact with them. So we could imagine the possibility of creating a conservancy without creating conservation refugees. And we have 14 uh, registered conservancies around Masai Mara, but ours, is the only one fronting a model where people and wildlife lives together. The other models are people have to be removed from the land to create space for tourists who are coming to pay $2,000 a night. And they are promised a space of about 350 acres per bed so that you don't see any people, you don't see wildlife, you don't see livestock. But in our conservancy, we are telling tourists, come for a cow safari. You will see Maasai here, you will see a cow there. But there is no way you can uh, deprive people who live on the land uh, and deprive them of uh, their usual means of uh, livelihood. What do you think? Yeah, that's true. Um, I just think it's a very important point to emphasize uh, because, you know, with after the commercialization of the Masai Mara, 
there are many conservation efforts and um, many are run with very good intentions and a belief that, you know, of kind of rewilding and of creating vast spaces for uh, wildlife. It's significant that there aren't others that have been created, governed by, uh, and, and for the benefit of community members, the ones who, the other ones, they may create an, a nice school or a clinic, but the people are displaced and the mass I call them, so these are conservation refugees. There is an idea, this gets to deep philosophical ideas you were talking about, Harry, about wildlife. I think there's a Western idea of paradise that doesn't involve human beings, that involves, that loves this idea of something innocent and pure before our fall. But our only salvation and our only possibility is with fellow human beings in places. And so uh, this is actually, um, though it's a very small, geographically small conservancy, it is a radically disruptive idea in the entire conservation system. And we'll tell you what, what kind of effect it's had. But, you know, and Nelson, here's a slide of you sitting under the tree. We're going from two sticks to the whole community. Yeah. So traditionally, the Maasai community, uh, what you are looking at is called Enkigwana. So Enkigwana is when elders sit under a tree to discuss solutions to common challenges. And actually, one other uh, important thing we are doing in our conservancy uh, around the concept of Enkigwana is that we have created a Maasai Stories Cafe, which we are calling Netiapa. A Stories Cafe is basically something like uh, what um, you know, Shalot has created here the possibility of people coming together to discuss their stories, to discuss common challenges, and, you know, to, to work together based on their common energy. But we'll talk about that uh, as we go on. This is Hank uh, Kiguana uh, and also Dixon Kylos. So the head of the Kenyan Wildlife Conservancy Association, just again to locate you, uh, National Eye borders on the Maasai Mara National Reserve. It's very small, about 6,000 acres. Um, but the head of the Canyon Wildlife Conservancy Association calls it the missing link in the puzzle, the most uh, critical connecting corridor for elephants, lions, and other migrating Mara Seng Serengeti wildlife. So even though it's small uh, and we are disruptive in our intention, it's also a kind of, um, you know, at, at an, an incredibly significant ecological uh, intersection point. And for me, the most, there are extraordinary pictures of animals and landscape, but this is the most heroic picture. Um, what goes on, the nature of those conversations, the trust within the community that Nelson and Maggie have earned over the lifetime of the work that they've done, the, heroism of those people to say yes let's try it's cur it's courage they're very poor people they could have easily sold their land to somebody who wanted to come along and pay some money for the land then they would have had some money in their pocket to move to nairobi feed their children you know do good things not so good things it doesn't matter they made a decision to tough it out um it's not charitable people who come in from elsewhere the innovation is taking place within this conversation. And what they achieved is, you know, what this um, conservation, uh, the, the leading conservation journalist in all of East Africa said, um, the first ever community owned wildlife conservancy, which is a unique achievement that promises to inspire a positive change in the entire East Africa region. This is one of the reasons we can be a little bit hopeful for change, and it's what Cecil meant by the magic canoe, that sometimes the disruptors, as we would say in innovation language, but sometimes people who are willing to take the risk and try to do things differently at significant cost can show others possibilities that they couldn't imagine themselves. Yeah, and um, I think Maggie will just talk about the opportunities that um, have been realized um, for the community 
especially for the women. I will talk about the other opportunities for everybody else. You know, we, as we just formed it, uh, the, the official launch was just uh, two years ago. Ambassador Fund. Okay. So uh, after we formed uh, the conservancy, this meant that uh, people were receiving um, an amount of money because then they, they leased their land. So they have uh, an amount of money that they receive monthly. First and foremost, they sat with the community and decided that a certain percentage of these uh, amounts will go to a bursary bag so that you know, in uh, there before, we they used to do fundraising. So every time it was school opening, there will be uh, a ceremony at that bomb or that, trying to fundraise money to actually send their children to school. So this way, we had an amount that we put separately. And when it was time to open school, we then have, or rather the entire community could afford to pay school fees for their children. And then um, we... Is, is it any other example of a community created bursary fund in Kenya or East Africa where the community itself said okay we are going to essentially tax and contribute ourselves to the none that I know of so this this was so unique and I think that was so smart of the whole community to come up about that so again we thought now what happens to our women who didn't have an education so we went into looking for microfinances business or things we could do together to generate an income. This is because I strongly believe that women are the backbone of the society. And when we empower women by at least making them have money that they call their own, then their families are happier. You know, the whole community is happy. So together with the women, uh, we created a corporation whereby we will sit and make some soap. Uh, do beautiful beadwork on the bar soaps, package the soap and sell it to the lodges. And this way we have an empowered community. Women are able to actually put food on the table, pay or get their children uh, little things that they will require, like a pen and a book. Um, again, um, because of the cultural practices, so for example, of the girls getting married at a very tender age, uh, we Actually, or rather myself and the rest of the people that I work with, we will go into villages and tell people to send their children to school. Some will say that they can't afford. We will, through the proceeds of our business and well-wishers, are uh, able to stand with them, send them to school. Many kids are we? We, we have more than 50 uh, girls going to school and their school fees is paid for. Um, and then... Um, I, I kept thinking that what else can we do to help these girls? You know, giving them an education when they are at school, they are able to be empowered by knowledge and they can make decisions for themselves. They can know that a girl who goes to school versus a girl who drops out of school, there's a difference. A girl who goes to school will graduate, earn some money, I mean, enlighten the entire community, while a girl that is just married then just becomes a wife and a wood collector and water collector. So, um, there's a campaign I ran. At first, we created um, a theater drama called Cut the Cuts. Uh, this saw us go through villages, collect stories. We will, of course, change names and stuff like that. So we went into the villages, collected real stories, and then we created a, a, a play, a 60-minute play. We went into schools, showcased this, and then we were able to interact with the girls. What is it that we can do? What is it that we don't know that we need to know to help you stay in school? So we did that. And recently we did another one called Girl to Power. Again, using drama tools to enlighten the girls. And then we trained 10 girls who just finished high school, you know, to be advocates, to speak, to go out, to encourage uh, the girls. So uh, I'm happy that that community is getting enlightened that way. Through the conservancy? Yes, through the conservancy. So they gave me a title at the Conservancy, the Family, Gender and Education Coordinator, and that's what I do. Yeah, well, I gave her it. <laughs> and also just boss. Yeah, 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 in principle. Um, yeah. Um, I, it, <laughs> so is there something very significant about this? Um, 
in a world of many problems, and we can talk about it more, um, something happens. Something happens when uh, people discover courage, discover a little bit of agency, are willing to embark on something that hope and courage are things that can grow. And um, so in a very short time, and certainly not without many, many challenges, including governance challenges, not everybody's, you know, successful community development is not utopia. It's just human beings, you know, muddling through together, which we've always had to do. But since the formation of the Conservancy, and by the way, this is at the sort of leading edge of ecological science, that this is from a journal of ecology that said, wildlife has been in free fall throughout most of Africa and only local people can reverse the spiral. So it's national life though it's using very old practices is at the forefront of conservation practice. And in a, oh yeah, can I just, can I just, so we, we hired um, local men to be the um, scouts. Um, there are actually 15 of them now, four of them used to be potent. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we're becoming an empire. <laughs> and uh, we're about to buy out Nestle's. <laughs> yeah. But four of these guys used to be four of these guys used to be poachers. Poaching is a big problem, but uh, and poaching is a is a mafia and it's linked to terrorism. And I've linked to ter to big markets, but at the very front end of it, the people who are forced into poaching are people who are living in poverty. Poverty changes people's decision quantity. Anyway, uh, we have uh, apparently 19, uh, 19, 19 and, our warden, and our warden was, yes, and a warden. And really the extraordinary work on uh, women, uh, youth, young girl, uh, education, development, and empowerment is the most significant social development work. Um, and building a I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad you I'm glad you asked because water is a problem. And, uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, we sit under the tree and discuss <laughs> problems and come up with solutions the whole day. And um, one of the problem that, uh, as I say, as you know, so basically the conservancy is a very good thing. It's good for people, it's good for wildlife. And the community is already ripping in the benefits. They are earning income. And this dovetails into what Maggie is doing because when the community is empowered, no one see the need to, you know, put their child, girl child into forced marriage in exchange for dowry because they're already getting income. So this has actually helped Maggie in her work because families are now empowered. We are really uh, staring down at poverty, something that was in, unimaginable to do before. Uh, some of the things that uh, we are doing is clean water program for the community. Um, unfortunately, these are old pictures. We have new pictures of a clean water distribution system, and it's good that because today we talked about uh, the challenge of water facing cities and threatening the lives of millions. So we are doing, as National Eye, we are doing a water project. Uh, where we have our safari camp, Alderpoi. Uh, Alderpoi sits on a water tower. It's a mountain where the camp is located. And below the mountain, we have a natural spring, which unfortunately just disappears into the ground in a swamp without running off the surface. So people are not really accessing water. So they have to rely on water from a polluted river called the Sekinani River, which is dying anyway, because as I said earlier, when I asked a question, rivers in Kenya are actually drying up. But luckily we have this water 
in the camp, which at the moment is just benefiting the camp usage and the guests who are coming. So we did a, a campaign and got some money to actually build an underground water tank below the aquifer and channeled all the clean water after filtering it into that aquifer. And then it is uh, you know, powered by solar energy into an overhead distribution tank. And the water is then distributed through a system of pipes through the conservancy into different villages. And currently the water project, which is about to be commissioned, will fill on a six kilometer pipeline of uh, pipeline and serve over 2,000 people. At the moment, uh, there are long queues in hospitals as people check into the dispensaries uh, because of health issues relating to waterborne diseases. Actually, um, in the Maasai culture, because of waterborne diseases, the, the rate of mortality affecting children is very high. In such a manner that children are rarely getting their proper names until they reach the age of two years because no one is sure that the child will survive. So they're just given a little pet name in case something happened and they die, then there is no attachment. But hopefully with our water, clean water system for communities, our conservancy would have contributed again uh, towards uh, save communities and uh, health communities, yeah. Um, no, no, so it's great. Um, so also since the formation of the Conservancy just two years ago, every inch of fence uh, in the land has been taken down and uh, the community has agreed to a rotational grazing pattern um, set by the elders. So we, it is possible to keep the wildlife and the grazing on the land but this um, rotational grazing pattern is uh, enforced. I mean, people agree to it, but it is monitored and enforced. That's one of the things that our scouts do. Uh, it's a significant thing that all of those fences have come down. And in uh, a very short time, as Nelson likes to say, the animals vote with their feet. So you have to imagine that this land was, uh, when we were you know, there, I mean, of course, there are dry seasons, rainy seasons, but it was very depleted landscape. And in a very short time, there's been this rapid return of uh, herbivores. Yeah. I'll just, yeah. you can you want to talk about That's it? Oh, talk. you want to She's talk about it? She likes going, we live inside the conservancy and um, it's a bit of a fire. And Maggie like, uh, you know, yeah, sitting so. at the balcony of our house and photographing all the wildlife while it's passing and walking by. Yeah, yeah so, so when I look at these pictures and what has become of Nashlai, sometimes it, there, there are tears in my eyes. But then again, it tells me that there is power in, you know, conservation or believing in, believing in your causes. When you, you set out to go do something, it's possible. For as long as you don't give up, it's possible. This was bare land. We will walk and run in the morning. Right now, at the gate of our home, there are lions lying, there are elephants, there's everything. So this is a true, true testimony. You see, giraffes, giraffes giving, birth. giving birth, look at elephants. This tells us that the ecosystem is very healthy. And yeah. Yeah. I, I remember before we started the conservancy, um, I felt so angry about what I saw. Uh, we were walking with Maggie. Um, we are, we are, we are you know, our parents own land, so. Conservation is a consolidation of land, so that it's no longer my piece of land. So we have removed fences, even though it's legally, you know, owned to us, but now it's for us once again. So before that, we were walking through the woods and just taking a walk, nice couple walking, and we came across this big, massive elephant. Uh, last night we had some gunshots but we were not sure what was happening. But the next day when we were taking a walk in the woods, we came across this huge, massive elephant, dead, no tusks. 
And then we came across, remember what we came across? The a car, double cabin. A double cabin with a Chinese tourist, uh, I mean Chinese people, living uh, the scene. The scene. Uh, so poaching is real. Our um, scouts have been working hard to report any poaching incidents. They are well trained. Our warden has just been, has just won an award, the best ranger uh, in Africa award. The animals have returned back to the land. They have fought it back with their feet because they could notice the shift in attitude, the care for place given by the people. And but most importantly, our people now have hope. They have been able to retain back their land because as in the words of one elder, the land does not even belong to them. It belongs to their children. It belongs to the future generations. Masai Mara is a well-headed site. So we are not doing ourselves a favor by protecting it. We are actually doing a favor to our world because these are shared resources. When I come here and I look through the windows and see all that unspoiled landscape, and it's not by any coincidence, Charlotte has been big battles to retain it like that, then my heart just opened up with joy because that's what I would like to see happening in our world. You know, so our stories mirrors one another. What is happening here is also important, uh, you know, in, in our area. So we are the world, not just for ourselves, but for the future generations. I'll tell you a very quick story, um, or Nelson and Maggie, and I'll tell it together, uh, just to give you an idea, because Again, these are not fairy tales. These are real human beings in a real world faced with real challenges, um, but it's working. And it's not just the habitat, it is the community that I, where you can feel the sense not only of breaking the back of poverty, but of a courage and a kind of collective will growing. So Maggie talks about the creation of the bursary fund. Again, Nelson has told me that, that nobody knows of another initiative like that where this is not an outside charity saying let's support, support girls education these are poor people saying the future our future as maasai people depends on education we therefore must find a way to pay for that education with our own money of course if other people want to support it that's great but the self-determination of this project this is not the creation of some outside you know uh, do-gooder foundation this is the self-determination of the community. And the community's wealth and future depends on its education, its prosperity, and on the well-being of the uh, habitat. And so um, there's a picture I can't show you because it's just too gruesome. But one day, um, because at night, uh, people come into their bomas, and their bomas are like corrals, and that's where they bring their livestock. And uh, one night, and it was an unusual situation, wasn't it, Nelson? Because these are like bachelor lions. When the yeah, uh, so the very rogue lions broke into the bone at night. This is a very unusual thing, and slaughtered all of the goats. So that would mean that that family, that extended family's entire wealth, was wiped out, like the man you described in Pakistan. Entire family is wiped out. The, the wealth of the family is wiped out. People came out in the morning and they were um, in shock and utter despair. Nelson said that some of them were close to dying just from the trauma of what had happened and of seeing everything that all of their wealth and possessions destroyed. And of course, some of the young men wanted immediately to retaliate and go out and kill the two lions that had been responsible for the slaughter. But to do that would have been violating the principles of the, uh, of the conservancy. And so there was an attempt by some of the elders to try to hold back that. I think you were there, weren't you, Nelson? Yeah. And, yeah. and then word got out throughout the conservancy and then a woman heard to the bar with one of her goats. These are poor people and gave a goat, this field of slaughtered goats. And she said, here's, one, here's my goat. And then somebody else came and somebody else came. And by the end of the day, more than 300 goats. And... More than that. Yeah. 
And what I want to say about that is that is not just an act of charity or generosity. That's solidarity. That's people standing together and saying, if we're committed to making this way of life work, then we have to stand together. And those forms of solidarity, community cohesion, in the face of great challenge, I, I mean, to me, in, and I work in many areas of social change, but the example of this and what it takes for human beings to do that with one another and for one another is very, very powerful. Uh, and I think, Nelson, that leads to um, what's now going on, because what the example of National Eye has become and what it's sort of helped to spawn. Yeah. Um, yeah, so National Eye has been inspiring the creation of like-minded conservancies. But, uh, and then that has always been our intention to expand our idea and create good for conservancy uh, communities. You know, what do you call it? Good for, good for community uh, conservancies. And so just last week before I came here, there was a neighboring community that also was inspired by what we were doing and like, you know what is inspiring us? We could have taken our parcels of land and found an investor that we could pay us money, but we don't want to deal with local. We don't want to deal with uh, investors and this kind of people because ultimately they will uh, they have their own intentions and you know. So what? How, how did you do it? because we are so inspired that this is a fast conservancy led by the local people. Um, so our conservancy is actually uh, the governance structure. We don't have any foreign interest or uh, in, it's just the people themselves. We combine scientific knowledge with traditional knowledge in the running of the conservancy. So our conservancy is actually uh, inspiring other people to follow the model. Uh, one of the larger conservancies called Pardamat, actually the largest conservation area in the Mara, uh, is now entirely following up our model. It's 50,000 uh, hectares, yet our conservancy is only about 3,000 hectares. So we have just, uh, you know, proved what Rick, my friend Rick, <laughs> called the shock of the possible, that it's possible for communities to hold the solution in their own hands. Uh, so a new conservancy, a certain, is being created also following up on our footsteps. So it's possible. So, um, and the White Mountain Initiative, which, are also, which we also involved with. So basically the White Mountain Initiative is a restoration, uh, community-led conservation effort where the community themselves have decided they have a role to play in returning back the ice caps which have been lost on the Mount Kilimanjaro, another iconic um, tower, you know, for the beauty of the world, for the beauty of Africa, you know. That was actually one of the things which inspired the early explorers to come to Africa, seeing a mountain with ice across the equator. That was unbelievable. And, you know, scientists and um, explorers came leading to colonial rule and all that. But that iconic tower, just like the ice caps in the North Pole or the Arctic Circle are falling apart. And local communities have decided once again that the solution into restoring the lost ice caps of Kilimanjaro lies with them. So they have begun a landscape regeneration program for afforestation, permaculture, restoration of livelihoods, planting of trees, with the aim that by 2029, we would have done something to restore back the ice caps of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. And in closing, um, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I was supposed to talk from three to four, but I can make a very brief presentation. You want a break and then uh, I can talk or a little. I can wrap up quickly with. All right. Well, um, I had a presentation scheduled uh, called Why Community, but I can just say what I think very quickly. Um, first of all, um, somebody who is a mentor and friend to me, a great ecologist named Buzz Holling, um, said a number of years ago, I was organizing something in Oregon called Resilience Regions, which was to bring bioregional actors together. And I, Buzz, who'd done a huge amount of work on resilience, wrote me a little note and he said, look, when uh, systems are in trouble uh, and nature, when they are hyper-organized and ill-adapted to the um, externalities and external pressures that they face, nature starts to invent. And there are many experiments that start happening everywhere. And when some of those experiments are successful, they start to connect. And so we are, I believe, at one of those periods, um, not just ecologically, but socially, politically, economically, where our rigid systems are no longer capable of sustaining the life that we want to live. Um, and that there are many experiments going on, and National Eye is a very important example, and Potentino is a very important example, and Salmon Nation is a very important example, and what's going on in Newfoundland is a, in Newfoundland is a very important example. And people are beginning to uh, realize and beginning to develop not only the experiments, but some of the conceptual frameworks that help us to understand this. Regenerative ideas, both in nature and uh, in economy and finance. I mean, I would say these are still very marginal, both within, um, I mean, there's a lot of conceptual work to do. There's a huge amount of work to do to get those ideas to move, either to, to disrupt, absolutely disrupt the dominant systems or to become a kind of a normative shift within the, uh, the, uh, the dominant decision making. System, so we start to make decisions based on different kinds of things. I, I am, I work on a li lot of different social change projects. I, you know, I've had the privilege of being part of this National Eye Initiative. Um, I am working on ideas of social inclusion and trust and social cohesion in Europe, challenged by um, the so-called refugee crisis, but what is going to be obviously a, a, an amplifying migration and democracy crisis in this part of the world, working on justice transformation in Canada. I, I do a lot of different kinds of work and I always have over my life. We heard, I told you about Cecil Paul at the beginning and the magic canoe at the, the Kitlope River. And the first time I was up there with him, and I was going up the river, Cecil said to me, um, as you go up the river, uh, you have to put your hands in the river and wash your face in the waters of the Kitlope. You have to do that so that your eyes can see more clearly and your ears can hear more clearly what the world is trying to tell you. And Cecil, like Maggie and like Nelson, have been great mentors to me in my ongoing struggle to understand not only how to bring about change, but what, what has to be changed, and even more significantly, what change is for. We can all say we want to change the world. We can all be mad as fuck at what is fucked up. But what do we want? And in 45 years of working on social change, I can tell you that I, there are very few people I talk to who know what they want. I have an idea of what a good society is. When I was with Cecil, and this I think is the thing that really connected Nelson and me. And remember, Cecil, this man who had been um, ripped away from his whole life, punished an unbelievable suffering in the residential school system and a, a life of a derelict that ends up being a catalyst and champion for the saving of the largest intact coastal temperate rainforest in the world. And I remember we were sitting talking one night and he said, you know, you guys, meaning white guys, 
you call it the Kitlop, the Kitlop River. Um, but we call it Hushtawashta Nuyam Jis, which means land of the milky blue waters and the sacred stories contained in this place. You guys think it's a victory because we saved the land. But what we really saved are our stories, which are contained in this land and which hold all of our wisdom for living. And so while we're also connecting across geographies, which I think very similar kinds of struggles, whether they're in the heart of Athens or a Tuscan Valley or in Newfoundland um, or in the Maasai Mara, we're also connecting to older ways of knowing. I'm not, I'm not a Rome, I don't want to glamorize indigeneity. We're just human beings. But there are other ways of knowing that our ancestors, Nelson and Maggie, talk about, you know, a nationalized the place where the bones of their ancestors are buried. And there are wisdoms that are gnarled into our being because of the victories and de defeats um, that our ancestors have had. And after years and years of working on social change, I don't claim to have many uh, answers, but I have come to believe with all my heart that our well-being, and actually look, I've got a, uh, is it here? No. Um, I was giving a talk to Maasai, young Maasai warriors about su successful societies. What is a successful society? It turns out there's very deep, important social scientific research on this. And a characteristic of successful societies is connectedness. Everything that we're talking here, it's not just connectedness to the land, although that's incredibly important. Nature has some of the answers for us and some of the sustenance, but we need community more than anything. The flaw in our Western and developed ideas is that our well-being is individual and that, um, our, that, uh, that what we gain through uh, our productive efforts um, create all of the conditions for our well-being. But when you look at the science of well-being, it's actually, once you get past a certain point of prosperity and it's not very high, it's our connectedness to one another. Community, I think, is um, an idea that is lost in our, in our logic of our well-being. And I think that there is uh, not a green revolution, but a, and not a land revolution, but a relational revolution that we may be in the midst of. Um, it's our hope, and it's also going to require the greatest courage and wisdom maybe that humankind has ever needed because as we move into a, um, a time of scarcity, there's an equally good chance that we're going to forget everything that we have known and learned about how to be together, how to create democracies and decision-making, how to disagree, how to disagree in diversity, how not to know one another, but come together, as my friend Francesca says, understand our human connectedness and see past our differences to something that's human. If we don't figure out these skills in the 21st century, we are, our, our demise is going to be uh, as tragic as anything that we can possibly imagine. I think there are huge lessons written in our uh, neural structures about, the, about our relational needs and our relational possibilities. And thank you very much. You talked um, about traditions and customs and somehow relinquishing them. And it's absolutely fascinating um, that, you know, the Maasai clearly have um, a, 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 an, an extraordinary identity, which they've retained, whereas much of the world has sort of homogenized. 
how do you today decide what traditions, how to modernize? Um, it's quite interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure you can answer this, but I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on it. For example, you've talked about modernizing certain customs in relation to you know, the, the cutting of women and women's education, but I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, uh, thank you so much. It's a, um, it's a very good and important uh, question um, because indeed the Maasai have actually become the iconic uh, tribe of Kenya. Like we have 45 different tribes in Kenya, but out of all those, it's only the Maasai who are still keeping their culture alive in spite of all that is going around them. And actually the most uh, important factors which are affecting the Maasai culture are education, which actually advocate for a different school of thought. Um, and then also religion like Christianity, uh, which does not appreciate the African context of living. So uh, this is a challenge that even us as a community, we are grappling up with. Um, so it's a matter of uh, understanding what old things we need to keep as a community and what new things do we need to retain? But the most important thing that um, we have to retain if ultimately we are going to keep our culture is our land. Because the moment we lose the land, we lose two things. We lose connectedness to the land, we lose the language, and ultimately we lose the leadership. And when the language is gone, uh, leadership is gone, then uh, we will ultimately die down as a Maasai community. And that is, um, yeah, thank you so much. So these are the things which are, um, you know, inspiring us to try and keep the land together so that we don't lose it, because the moment we lose it, we have lost language, we have lost culture, we have lost leadership. And uh, it's not easy. But uh, personally, uh, I believe that uh, education is one important thing that we have to keep. Because when you have education, it broadens your mind. Um, you can feel confident being a master in person. You don't have that uh, kind of, uh, you, you know, like uh, some, when you don't have education, you, you know, you try to act out as if you are someone different. You know, like for example, some of our brothers who have not gone to school, um, they are living kind of a life which is hard to describe. When they go to the towns, Nairobi, you find someone dressing up in trousers and then sandals and almost something like a rock. So half between a modern person and a Maasai, and then they lose it, and that is, that sense of dressing could be applied to the disconnect that people are feeling. But with education, it gives you, you know, understanding, okay, that, you know, it's possible to become a master. It's possible to retain uh, the good aspects of the culture, which are actually many, our, our language, our stories, um, our ceremonies. And then we get rid of those things which don't have a place in our community today. We get rid of, uh, you know, female genital mutilation. We send our children to school. So education actually gives us a possibility to understand the new things we need to embrace and the old things that do not matter which we need to get rid of. Thank you. Uh, I just say, um... First of all, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, you know, we, I mean, we're trying to establish a connection with uh, the space station so that there can be uh, monitoring, species monitoring. Um, so it's very leading edge science. Young people are incredibly interested in that. Um, and, you know, finding that intersection, like Nelson said, between the old things and the new things, 
Um, my sense is that saints, all saints societies uh, are committed to the well-being of the members of that society. And successful societies create the conditions in which it's possible to work on that. And sustainable societies uh, have resilience so that they continue to learn and adapt. I mean, you're British, um, not like, um, you know, not like you were in the Middle Ages. Well, some Brits, but um, no, yeah, you know, cause there are cultures that are not, uh, that continue to evolve. They're not museum cultures. Um, but the, the difficulty is the lure, uh, uh, the sort of glitter and lure of the West at a time. But some indigenous people are saying, wait a second, why do you want us to have your education to go into your labor markets, to make your money, to buy your consumer goods, when you, if we really look at you, seem to be like those people who are disconnected in our tribe that aren't doing so well because they've forgotten who they are. So there'll be a big shift in what is an understanding of value. Any other questions? Yes. Um, most of all, thank you. This has been so interesting and, and also sort of surprising how similar topics can be, you know, thinking of Tuscany and our rea reality here where um, preserving the culture is such a big issue. That's why people also come and visit. And um, but then the people who come and visit also in a way a problem to um, to the to the culture. But that one thing just which is great to hear is that um, preserving culture doesn't mean um, putting it in a sort of container, uh, airtight, and cutting it off from anything else that's happening otherwise in the world, which is sometimes here the approach that seems, you know, museum culture or Disneyfication of a, of a place. That's a big issue for Italy that we're sort of, you have these amazing places, but they're not really alive anymore. They're, and um, what, I, what I sort of was wondering with the ed education, here, if you look at young people, Edu the, the issue is often that they, when they're well edu educated, they will leave because there's not much they can do. You know, either you go into agriculture or tourism. And how do you see that? How, or is that something you're thinking about? You know, not that everybody has to stay, people are also allowed to leave. But I was wondering how you sort of, you, just hearing your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so actually that is a reality um, which cannot be wished away uh, because even in Kenya where we come from, um, there's a lot of migration from the rural areas into the cities where often there are more opportunities and especially with more people getting an education, it is uh, quite difficult for them to come back to the village. Uh, yeah, so, but again, uh, we are doing all the best we could to create opportunities in the village. Like, uh, for example, um, around our area, the conservancy movement, there are 14 conservancies employing hundreds of people. So it means uh, it's actually possible for young people in our community to go to Nairobi or go to Narok or other cities and come back home. And so they have to be sure that there could be opportunities at home. So we are also, for example, running a training center. So instead of the youth going into Nairobi and uh, acquiring, you know, uh, that other ways and all that, they could actually go to school nearer to their village so they can go back in the evening and help with their families. And uh, we are training local women uh, to work in our camps and go back to their villages and do whatever they need to do with their families. So I think it boils down to the issue of creating opportunities uh, around the cultural uh, epicenters so that uh, people do not necessarily have the need to go into the big cities. Like we need to create opportunities around where we live. Yeah, what do you think, Ravi? 
Yeah, so um, we have seen rural urban migration. We have seen people who came to the city, had their education, and went back to the village to give back to their society. And us as leaders of that community, we are a living testimony. We tell people that it's possible to go even abroad. Yeah. Go get the knowledge, bring it back home, help help somebody else. You know, let's be those people who have, who uplift one another. Go get whatever knowledge you, you will get, bring it home, help someone else. And that way we will have a strong community. We will have a community that is knowledgeable, a community that can face tomorrow. And for example, yeah. also our, our son, we have a 17-year-old son uh, who is in high school. So previously he was, he was born, you know, when telling our story earlier, when, you know, Mangi was working in an office in Nairobi, I was a college lecturer and a hotel manager at night. Mm -hmm. So we were having busy city lives and our kids were born in Nairobi and they were going to school in Nairobi, but we have taken deliberate moves to take them back home. So and our teenage son is now having his education in his, the same school where I went to, learning the connectedness again with people, with the language. So that should be encouraged. And I, I just say this, and then probably it's enough that we move on. But um, in the short, <clears throat> right now, the economy, um, I mean, the traditional economy is pastoralism, the commercial economy is tourism, and that most of the employment is in tourism or, you know, making uh, jewelry for tourists and so, being safari guides, so on and so forth. That's where the revenue is. Uh, what is going on at National Eye and the Maasai Mara is one of the most important experiments in the 21st century. How do you re-establish re a sustainable relationship between people and place? And the long-term intention, mid to long-term intention, remember we've only been around for two and a half years, is in fact to create a knowledge economy um, and ultimately uh, kind of, we have already registered the training and cultural training institute this uh, picture that you can't see, but it was up there. We are building something that we call Netiapa, the Stories Cafe. Be fast. And um, really, the education uh, in the sh in the midterm, I don't think the mass uh, youth or other youth need to go to Nairobi or New York for their education because there's a phenomenal amount to learn about how to live in the world about everything from science to governance to economies, um, not just you know traditional ways, but how to live on their traditional land in the 21st century in a sustainable way. And we are determined that in fact, there's going to be a ro very robust knowledge economy. I mean, it looks you know nice and traditional, but we see um, National Eye as a place of extraordinary innovation, experimentation, innovation, working at the frontier of knowledge and then like business people capitalizing on that knowledge and turning it into something that is um, marketable. Yes. I have the yeah, just, you know, so, I'm going to invite you to come.